Leave a sign, cast the web, solve the crime, avoid the trap, get the praise, kiss the girl, save the day, be a superhero. Count down the top 20 ultimate superheroes, villains and vixens, Wednesdays on Sky One. I love Indiana Jones. And catch them in action across three weekends on Sky Movies. The ultimate superhero season starts Wednesday the 17th of August on Sky. Mazda 5. Surprisingly stimulating. What can you make with a courgette, onion, cheese and a few lion eggs? Courgette frittata. Lion eggs make a meal out of anything. Introducing Head & Shoulders Cool Menthol for maximum refreshment. It gets rid of 100% of flakes with an icy cooling sensation. It's the coolest way to get rid of dandruff. You're as cold as Don't let dandruff get in the way of something beautiful. So how was Vegas? Hi, I'm Mrs. Air. Babe, we gotta bling this place up. I hit the jackpot. We're gonna need it. The new Argos catalogue has changed with over 3,600 extra products. From the ordinary to the extraordinary. She's very demanding. Tell me about it. The new Argos catalogue. It's the big one. Anything to declare? Max Wild! Declare my undying love for Brussels sprouts, steam swedes, artichoke hearts, and fennel and beetroot! Real kids aren't always into stuff that's good for them. New Sunny D Caribbean can help. Unlike most fizzy drinks, each glass contains a day's supply of vitamin C. And it's available with no added sugar. New Sunny D Caribbean. Because no child's like Max Wild. And yams, and dentals, and seaweed! Nothing is more effective at treating acute bacterial conjunctivitis than Optrex infected eyes. The first antibiotic eye drop available without prescription. Optrex infected eyes. Ask your pharmacist. Introducing Aquafresh Extreme Clean. Its microactive foam seeks out sources of bad breath, even in the pores of your tongue, leaving you so refreshingly clean you can't help feeling a change. Fresh Extreme Clean for your teeth and tongue. Take the feeling of clean to the extreme. Stop! I was only sleeping. Look, I've still to swim with dolphins. See a Dutchman lift the World Cup. Join the Mile High Club. Rest for the wicked, eh? Welcome back, and we're just about to crash into the top ten. But before we do that, let's have a little recap. At number 20, the first of three bones in the living daylights. At 19, the scary lady, it's Christine. Don't let Ferris Bueller anywhere near your Ferrari. 
Our fine four feathered friend is at 17. At 16, Thelma, Louise, the T-Bird and the Grand Canyon. And multiple mayhem from the Blues Brothers. An E-Type with a clever spray job at 14. And at 13, Bond starts to get just a little bit silly. The world's daftest police car, Starsky and Hutch in the Grand Torino. And Mel Gibson was Mad Max, but we just remember the car. At number 10, the missing link between Adolf Hitler and Walt Disney. This little motor, still the world's best seller coincidentally, was practically a cartoon character anyway, but a phenomenally successful run of live action family movies secured its status as the best loved car on the planet. It's Herbie. Herbie? Herbie's quite a girly car film. Oh, I love Herbie. It had a heart, it was a human, it had a personality. Every time you open a garage up and look at a beetle, it's not a car, it, it's, it's a smiley thing. The character's just written over the bonnet and the eyes and it's just the, the whole thing just works brilliantly. If Herbie had talked, he would have sounded like a... Herbie is very much a, a car R2-D2 because uh, there's no actual words but just by kind of moving around from you know one wheel to the other and making a few kind of whirring noises you kind of know what he means. I've literally just passed my driving test, I was 17 and I drove my first Beetle about a week later and you know it's not going to happen but I just kind of wanted it to do stuff and you know. <laughs> But it still hasn't tarnished my memory of that. It's a great, great film. It's a good movie, very good movie. Well, in 1969, when I saw The Love Bug, I guess you could say I fell in love with Herbie. Wonderful baby, living on love. The he represents a lot of things to me. He represents love and your dedication, you know, loyalty, and these childlike qualities, you know, that, that are really special. I think Kirby is alive and real. The world has gone crazy. I'm glad I'm not you. He's like a like a little kid, you know. He wants somebody to love him. He wants somebody to accept him. And so for me, Kirby was, you know, like a friend. Kirby, that year it was released, had outgrossed Bullet. It had outgrossed uh, Funny Girl and, and uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. There were a lot of very well-known, visible, successful pictures released that year, but Herbie outgrossed them all. But developing a relationship with a car was not difficult for me because, uh, as Walt said, he says, Dean, you talk to nobody better than any actor I've ever seen. Walt appreciated that, and I guess he thought I could also talk to a car. <laughs> that car really was built under the influence of Hitler, you know. <laughs> You've got, you know, a car there that um, you know, Hitler was involved in its design and its making, and then all of a sudden it's a love bug. Hitler didn't come up with the idea that the car would have a mind of its own. That was Walt Disney. I had to cut all the scenes out where the tire actually went see Kyle, you know, every occasionally. And people who go on about Hitler with the Beatles, they can all just sod off. I mean, it, it has got a Nazi connection, but you can't deny the fact that the Germans are genius people and the Beatles were one of the best cars ever made, period. Now this is your list, so I can't quibble, but this one, at number nine, really? Cannibal Run is, is a genuinely terrible film. Cannibal Run is just basically a poor imitation of Wacky Race. It's a great a classic car movie involving lots and lots and lots of different cars, so it's a real petrol head sort of sit down Sunday afternoon, can a Newcastle Brown. It was such a good film because all the old school were there, all the, the Rat Pack Brigade was there. I remember it being awesome and very funny and absolutely full of cars. The movie was based on the transcontinental race of the same name and was originally intended for Steve McQueen, but then came Uber medallion man Burt Reynolds and the laughs were turned up to the max. Cannonball Run was 
the greatest race that I ever drove. I said to Brock, I said, you know, that's a hell of an idea for a movie. Why don't you run the cannonball again? We'll give everybody a tape recorder and a paper, a notepad, and we'll take all their notes and we'll make a movie out of it. Because he's a writer. He said, good idea. To take a bunch of nuts like that and run them across country, violating every rule, law there is, and survive it is kind of fun. The best bit, I think, in Cannibal Run was the Lamborghini Countach, the way it changed colour. And I know the men like the, uh, the busty babes in it. Two women in, in kind of very lurid coloured jumpsuits were with e enormous breasts. Such terrible stereotyping people, but that's nonetheless brilliant. The original 60s Batmobile remains a much-loved custom classic. The late 80s movie had an awful lot to live up to, but director Tim Burton and designer Anton First certainly came up with a car that matched the gothic atmosphere of the rest of the film. It looked like a bat, it could drive itself, and it had flames shooting out of the back of it. When Tim Burton was announced as the guy who's going to make Batman, you knew that he was going to do something different with the Batmobile. The Batmobile was no longer a Detroit joke. It was a menacing black phallus of a vehicle. He took a 40 skyscraper and turned it on its side, and it's an absolutely gorgeous Batmobile. It was totally out there, it was totally inspired. When I saw the Batmobile, I almost jumped out of the seat. I mean, the people next to me was like, what's going on with this guy? I was so excited. It's got to have that high camperita and preposterousness, which it had. I was well impressed with the car. And it just goes chick, 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 chick. Oh, oh, and sort of eats itself and turns into a great big snail. I used to live in Blackburn, and I could really have done with that, rather than just locking it. And I might not have lost my car five times. Who's car are you gonna nick? The, like the BMW down the road or Batman's car? I won't nick Batman's car because it's turned into a shell. No, you won't nick Batman's car because he'll kick the out of you if you nick Batman's car, basically. The 1989 Batmobile has spawned a very close-knit group of replica owners. Most people refer to me by my website address. Those who don't know my name will say, you know, the Batcave 8K. That's what they refer to me by. Men, women, children, everybody loves and respects this car. And I think, given the chance, anybody would want to own a replica that they could drive around. I love the car. I dream about the car. I, I, I have the car, and I still dream about the car. Um, like I said, I love the car. The Batmobile community, and by that I mean the people who own replicas, the people who build them, the people who mold the bodies, and the people who sell them and of course just the fans like you and me. That community is so tightly knit, it's really tough to penetrate it. And I've created a forum where people can come and talk about the car, share ideas and information, and not be afraid of, uh, of anything. You want to put the, the bombs that come out, you want the doors to open, you want oil slicks, you want all that to work. Everybody, no matter how humble and modest they are, everyone craves a little bit of attention. And the one thing that you get when you're driving this car is attention. Well, you know what they say. Chicks love the car. The number one film of 1977 might have been Star Wars, but running at a close second was a film that featured this car. Smokey and the Bandit was the was the chimpanzee. No. Smokey and the Bandit uh, features a Pontiac Trans Am, which a lot of people think is an American Ferrari. Really, it's the sort of car that your your cool uncle would have driven. The first time I saw the car was probably in the movie Smokey and the Bandit, and the car absolutely blew me away. Um, it was the coolest looking car I've ever seen in my life. Now, if your car is special edition, yeah. You are special. I think this car was the perfect car for Smokey and the Bandit. It's extravagant, it's kind of flashy, and that was sort of uh, Burt Reynolds' personality in the movie. 
and it's got this enormous kind of ridiculous bird of prey thing. Or it, it looks, looks a bit like a frightened pheasant. And it cost me $400 just for the sticker itself. I'd rather drive that, that semi truck, the lorry. Yeah, with the dog, Fred. <laughs> Ten more. CB radios had just come into being. I mean, they became the craze. Uh, Smokey the Bandit, of course, was the, the film that launched CB radio in the UK. You know, and I was growing up in Jersey, and by the end of the, you know, 78 or whatever, I mean, there were at least 12 people with CB radios. Bandit. Is that your name or your profession? That's my handle. My friend Anthony had a, he didn't have a car. He had a CB in his bedroom. Come on back, Gregor. We'll go here and answer. 10-4, hot pants, we copy. Let go of the button. He used to talk like 10-4, big buddy, we've got the Smokies on our tail. I'm like, Anthony, you, you haven't. You, you live in a bungalow. It's definitely a car movie. I mean, take the cars away, you got nothing left. It was a trip down to Texas to get a load of beer and Bert run in a blocker for him, and that's all it was. Isn't there like banjo music all the way through for about two hours? I think there is, which I quite like. I think probably the best stunt in, in Smoking Bandit is when uh, the Pontiac goes over the bridge and it was allegedly uh, done with, with rocket power. So I took it to my shop and I just had my uh, crew chief stick a big NASCAR engine in there and it had some horsepower. And then I had it, instead of having an automatic, I put a four-speed shift in there so I could get up speed and, uh, and that's all we did to it. It did get them across the river, but it got them <laughs> so far over the other side that if you actually watch the film, he sort of jumps it, and then the river ends here, and he just carries on flying. And I'll tell you, when it landed on the other side, that was a wrap on that car. It bent the frame and set the wheels out and did all kinds of funny things to it. What's this doing in at number six? Surely this film's just full of modified Japanese saloons. One for the max power generation, I'll wager. Too Fast, Too Furious wasn't as good as the first one. But, take the whole beginning sequence. It's all about the whole street racing thing. There's a few areas, uh, usually you find near railroad tracks, airports. Somewhere where they have a lot of long straightaways. Mostly industrial areas, you can find these races. Usually midweek, you know, somewhere where they're kind of a little bit undercover. Um, much like they did in the movie. Like its predecessor, Too Fast, Too Furious features a number of fluorescent Japanese imports. Certainly more of them than there is plot, anyway. Too Fast, Too Furious. Too stupid, too give it the bird. Another car movie that um, the laptop computer figured more prominently. No, screw that. Too Fast, Too Furious, the movie kind of developed as it went along. Um, I saw script revision 22. That's when I stopped even looking at the script. So it, um, I don't think it was even written until the film was done. It was cheesy, but very cool cheesy. Fast and Furious, we did 85 cars in two weeks. In Too Fast, Too Furious, we did 220 cars in two months. When you're filming a movie of this magnitude, it is corporate. There were 15 people involved in each vehicle. Southern California, there's a lot of import cars that guys are, are modifying. They're putting nitrous oxide, they're turbocharging, supercharging. They're actually now competing with these larger motors in the American cars. This 70 Dodge Challenger was used in the movie. This was Tyrese's car. It's 426 Hemi. In the movie, I believe they say that this can snap a Speedo in under 10 seconds. The Honda S2000 is very quick very powerful again with the nitrous oxide it's brilliant it was good they had a girl driving it definitely although i did think it was a bit stereotypical that her car was in pink in too fast too furious this was suki's car 
some of the actors and actresses had to go to a driving school, and Devin Aoki, which is Suki in the movie, actually learned how to drive her first stick shift car. I took her out back. We had a five-acre lot out back, and I put her in the car, and she immediately ran into a truck. One of the main things I liked about this movie was you have American cars and imported cars battling against each other. The import guys with their technology, they feel like it's time to pass the torch on to them. Which led a lot of kids to probably go buy nitrous kits, put it in their, you know, in their first car, and then suddenly watch the heads shatter through their hood. I had a car that had a nitrous oxide kit. For me, it's kind of fun to see the, the amount of technology and the different, uh, different ways that we can modify the car. You do a three second burst and yeah, it would launch you out of your seat, but boy, you better shut it down after three seconds because the RPMs just go right off the roof. And to see these guys, you know, holding down nitrous oxide for 10 seconds, you're out of your mind. That car would blow up around you. You'd be, stand you'd be skidding across the pavement on your ass holding onto a steering wheel. Nah, that's a cartoon. Next up, one of the classic caper movies of all time. Cars, girls, catchphrases, tunes, Michael Caine, Noel Card, Benny Hill's in it. It's a 24-carat classic. Blow the bloody doors off. I prefer to shut it gently. It's all the same to you. And that means you do everything I say. The Italian job is the best example of casting in a movie ever. Not Michael Caine or Noel Coward, although they're great, but the minis. The minis are just stars in their own mind. I remember seeing that movie before I knew what it was and wanted a Mini Cooper S. The Mini Cooper S has got a fantastic personality. It appeals to everyone. It's classless, uh, whether you're rich or poor. Uh, everybody loves a Mini. It's a cheeky little car. It outperforms most things, certainly in its day, um, most things on the road. My first car was the Blue Mini. Just have a love of driving, a love of fun. After seeing the Italian job feel, that was the reason why we put the three together. The Minis are the perfect vehicle for that film because it's all about the swinging 60s, Britain at a time where we felt we could take on the world. It's a jingoistic, patriotic, nationalistic rant. On so many levels, it just hits all the buttons. It says that the Italians are useless, hopeless and disorganised, and the Brits are fantastic. The irony is, of course, that uh, Michael Caine didn't have a driving licence when the uh, film came out. My favourite scene in the film is the jump. I do jumps myself, and to actually jump from one rooftop to another takes an awful lot of nerve. You know, when they jump those roofs, oh man, how cool is that? We never find out quite how they get to the top of the roof or how they get back down again, but that's not important. And it was a hundred foot drop from the top of the roof, and all the Italian extras were sort of saying goodbye and crossing themselves to all the stunt drivers. Look out, they're behind us. You better put your foot down, put your foot down, we're losing easy. Because up to that point in America, all we saw was these huge cars, and suddenly you see these toys tearing, just tearing the road up, like some sort of, you know, Shriner stunt team. It was great. <laughs> For me, in the Italian job, the scene that defines this incredible ability of this little car with its little face is when it's going round and round the tunnel, the sewer. Everybody has a memory that at some point one of those cars goes completely over the top, but they don't actually. They tried to do it, but it didn't actually come off. The sewer scene was actually shot uh, in, in Coventry. It wasn't done in Italy at all. And the difficulty with a full 360 degree within the tunnel was it, it's impossible to get the momentum uh, while you're travelling forwards to, to, to actually push yourself sideways as well. I think they tried three or four times, and I think on the fourth time the car landed on its roof and they gave up at that point. This is the, the Mini, without doubt, is the epitome of the British motor car. It's, uh, it's cheeky, nimble, cheap, 
and just great fun. Yeah, okay, it's tiny. Yeah, it's not particularly fast, but it's ours. Well, I'm trying to remember going into the seconds. Don't they have a list of cars they have to find or something? I like a film with a message. And the message is that expensive cars are fun and easy to steal. Gone in 60 seconds for that moment when they play low rider before they go out, Nick Cage. Let's do it. OK, let's ride. It's a ridiculous premise. He has to steal hundreds of cars within 24 hours or something like that with Angelina Jolie. I mean, if she was there, I wouldn't be stealing cars. I'd be making love. Stealing 50 cars, Angelina Jolie driving around in fast cars. You can see why lots of men like this movie. I like the way you move. Hot girls don't usually repair cars, do they? But in that movie, you know, she knew how to do the timing on a Ferrari, which, you know, commands respect, really. Like the way you move. To make a good car movie or a good movie with cars, and you have to appeal to the car enthusiast, and we're not, at heart, complicated people. Nice, simple plot that we can follow. Nice bloke, really likes car, gives car a name. We can follow that kind of plot. This is Eleanor, known affectionately. It was known in the movie as Eleanor, and affectionately known as Eleanor now. Yeah, the Carroll Shelby GT500, seven litre engine. I think it was 390 brake horsepower, 420 cubic inch, if I can remember. That thing would drink more than Oliver Reed. A great Mustang, without a doubt. And they had that dolled up pretty good. You know, they had that gunmetal paint job on it, which just made it jump out, without a doubt. You just listen to that car. It, it, it just has that roar, that deep throat, thundery sound that you don't get with, with a lot of European cars and modern day cars. What an awesome machine. The fact that he talks to the car, and he's got some history with the car, is quite sweet. Men who have names for their cars will, were still personalised number plates. It's just, it's getting a bit weird. No, 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 don't, don't, don't do this. Don't, don't start with me. They have that grand finale chase with the, with Eleanor. You know that Nicholas Cage isn't driving that car. It's probably not him going to get his own coffee. The hairy moments um, on the film for me were, were when Nicholas Cage was driving. <laughs> You've got a multi-million dollar actor here, and he's driving just as fast as we are. He says, oh, I know how close I am. And I said, that was like two inches away from the camera. And he knew every single time exactly how to put it through there, and he did it. So I'm very impressed. He manages to get away by flying a Ford Mustang. Now, for all its many merits, the Mustang is unable to fly. None of the stunt people on the film really enjoyed that shot. But because it was on a bridge at the time, we couldn't do a long jump because of the impact. They were afraid that the car would go through the bottom. When it landed, he would have smashed his spine to smithereens. I think a good car chase in a good car film, there's got to be a bit of realism about it. And as soon as you start playing around with it in that way, it loses the car enthusiast. I can't honestly remember what happens in the end. Does he do it? and rescue his brother or does he get his head chopped off? All I remember is the, is the some rather fine cars being driven around in a slightly irresponsible manner. Right, that's the end of part four, but don't go anywhere because next, it's your top three. <laughs>
I was miles away. Flash home car wash. The easy way to a flash motor. You thought you'd rubbed it all off last night. So why the Panda Eyes this morning? New Johnson's Eye Makeup Removal Pads make it all so effortless. Each ultra soft pad removes even waterproof mascara, leaving Panda Eyes on the Panda. Skin loves Johnson's because Johnson's love skin. Packed with little beads of invigorating freshness. New bold two-in-one tablets. She thought she chose this house, but this house chose her. The Skeleton Key. Now the DVLA don't need to look here for out-of-date tax discs. They don't even need to look here or here. If your car tax is out of date or if you haven't declared your car as off the road, there's only one place the DVLA now need to look. Here. And if you aren't up to date, the database will automatically issue an £80 penalty. Here. The new car tax rules. Are you up to date? The taste of summer? Busy and happily. Maybe describing the taste of Strongbow is too big a job for three men alone. Crunchily sweet. I don't think you can express the taste of Strongbow in words. Maybe we should surrender ourselves to fate. These are the ducks of fate. That says mellow. Do you approve of the word mellow? Uh, for sure. Flowering, poetic, and as pretentious as you, as you like. That's nice. Strongbow. Let the taste do the talking. Wise man. Hey, look, we got to make things better for our pay as you go customers. Have you got any ideas? Oh, uh, he says repay our prepay forever. Uh, give them up to 50% of their top ups back every month. Brilliant. Ooh. Wait, where'd he go? Whoa. Vanished like a wrinkly ninja. I know he would if he could. That's why he deserves delicious Caesar Italian style with beef and pasta. Miss Buxton, did you enjoy the test drive? <laughs> this is the dawning of the age of Aquaria. Well, that could be it. That is it. England win in style. Australia are hammered. That could be it. That is it. England win in style. Australia are hammered at Edgbaston. 262 for four. Enjoy another colourful history lesson with Life and Death in Rome at 11 after movie's greatest cars. Welcome back. Now, before we dive headlong into the top three, Let's recap the top 10 so far. And at 10, Herbie gets frisky in the love bug. At 9, the inexplicably popular Cannonball Run. It's big, it's black, it's the Batmobile. And somehow you managed to place Smokey and the Bandit at number 7. Is it really better than the original? You've put Too Fast, Too Furious, Too High at number 6. At five, small cars, big skills, the Italian job minis. It may be gone in 60 seconds, but it's your number four. And so we near the summit of our fabulous metal mountain. And at number three, we find a car that I would have bet my house on actually topping the whole list. This is the highest place Bond car. And it was the last time the film producers had to actually buy their own car. No such thing as product placement in the mid 60s, obviously. Even so, has there ever been a car as cool as this? 
I would have put that at number one simply because that car is so famous. The dog's private parts, it's fantastic. It's just so sexy. Just heart-stoppingly beautiful. Gold finger. I would love to just drive one of those cars. Yeah, that you know, that's a that's the kind of car you could park in your living room. The car that most closely defines the character of Bond would be the Aston Martin DB5. I think probably the best moment for that car is actually when you first see it. You'll be using this Aston Martin DB5 with modifications. Now, pay attention, please. Now, open the top and inside your defense mechanism controls. Smoke screen, oil slick, rear bulletproof screen, and left and right front wing machine guns. When Q says to Connery, Whatever you do, don't touch it. No, why not? Because you'll release this section of the roof and engage and fire the passenger ejector seat. Connery goes, ejector seat? You're joking. I never joke about my work, 007. I think that man really needs to have some sex. You marvel at this, this fantastic array of gadgets on the car. And what happens to your head is that you think, hmm, that would be useful on the M25. The gadgetry that was used on the Aston Martin were actually functioning gadgets. Everything from the tire slashers to the uh, ejector seat. Bond, after dispatching a huge number of gesticulating Asian henchmen, um, becomes confused by a mirror. Now I'm thinking that possibly Q back to the drawing board. Perhaps a polarizing filter on the windscreen or something like that. Or a, a, a thing that allowed him to flick the, the lights into, a, into infrared mode. He could have been killed. My passion for the DB5 began in 1964, October, the release of Goldfinger. And ever since then, I've wanted one, coveted one, looked for one. And eventually, 36 years later, I was able to acquire one. It's pretty enough to stop a speeding train. Inside would do justice to a first-class cabin on a 50s Cunard liner, super legger bodywork, hand-rolled aluminum panels, a double overhead cam, six-cylinder engine, and, you know, just gorgeous. I had the car completely overhauled, completely redone, restored. Every nut, bolt, washer, hose, clamp it was expensive, but it was a labor of love, and I have the car I've always wanted. But alas, the original movie car is no longer. It disappeared about five or six years ago, mysteriously. Uh, the only thing that actually still exists from that original car is this very tiny temperature gauge. To say that uh, this is the Aston Martin DB5 from Goldfinger would be an understatement, but unfortunately it is actually the only piece that survives to this day. If I were to compare this car to any living thing, it would be a beautiful woman. The curves, the lines, great styling, not always forgiving of mistakes, but always beautiful. It is the best Bond with the best car and the best villain. And I just, I wish I was the Bond girl. You built a time machine out of a DeLorean? Yes, Marty McFly wasn't the only one who couldn't quite believe it either. The makers of the brilliant Back to the Future trilogy originally wanted the time machine to be a refrigerator but were worried that small children would get stuck trying to mimic the action. So, a DeLorean, a gullwing, stainless steel field sports car built in Northern Ireland, was the obvious replacement, wasn't it? What a cool car that was. Now let's get one thing straight. The DeLorean is a piece of crap. The way the doors opened, wow. You've got these gull wings, which are great, except in a situation where you're parked between two other cars. And a young kid, Michael J. Fox, behind the wheel. It gave hope to all of us. It looks amazing. It can travel through time. That's brilliant. And it leaves flaming skid marks. Which is a phrase that still amuses me. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? 
Son of a DeLorean. It was an odd choice, wasn't it? But the, it was, there was something cheesily futuristic about the DeLorean. It's not actually an especially clever car. I mean, I think Doctor Who got it right with the telephone box, to be honest with you. There are people who, who collect them. And there are DeLorean fans who recreate the Back to the Future DeLorean, which I think is slightly odd. Power of love is a curious thing. I've always loved a DeLorean. You know, I loved it because of the movie. I loved it even before the movie, sitting it on the lot. Well, the process was first, first get the car nice and then start finding the props. Uh, it was quite difficult. So I had to dig up a lot of stuff from the stores, getting like the time circuits made up. And I wanted them to be right. You can actually program in these time circuits, your destination time, like the movie. I wanted the flux capacitor right. These two are the, probably the most unique things in the movie everyone thinks about. Normal people that drive a DeLorean, everybody gets the question, where's your flux capacitor? Bring me a dream. Dum, 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 dum. Make him the Not a vision of the future. Um, it is, or it was, just, I think, one of the worst cars ever made. There were certain bugs, and there was quite a few changes done throughout the manufacturing of the car. DeLorean managed to lock himself in the car on the press launch. It's 130 horsepower V6 aluminum block and heads. The Renault engine was an asthmatic, wheezy piece of cack. They were a little underpowered for the type of car, and I think that was a little a downfall on the car. A lot of guys bought them thinking they were getting Porsches or Corvette. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious I think it did 0 to 60 in about 12 seconds or something stupid. This for me, I think, was one of the best finds. I actually got it. I was digging through one of the, the yards and actually found the actual plug, you know, that they used in the movie. I know it's not part of the car, but it's part of the movie. You know, it's like you're finding gold, you know, when you find the actual, like, the plutonium gauges, you know, the exact same ones. You're going, great, you know. Oh, you a sight for sore eyes. DeLorean people who Absolutely. drive their DeLorean cars uh, drive them in L.A. Everyone stops, everyone looks, everyone talks to them. We get people screaming out of windows, putting their thumbs up, taking pictures. I saw two in one day once, and it blew my mind. I tease my husband all the time. I say this is his mistress, and, uh, you know, I'd rather have this mistress than <laughs> any other one. Well, we're going, we don't need roads. At the end, a little bit of a twist. You've seen it sort of driving through suburban America in the 50s, and then suddenly, out of the blue, the doc turns up in the DMC, says, come on, where are we going now? Gets in, wheels go underneath, disappears, becomes a flying machine. Amazing. OK, you've waited long enough. Which car did you vote as the greatest movie car of all time? It's British, right? It's, as an actor, it's a fantastic car. Would it be Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? It set precedence for every car chase that's been filmed. Would it be the Aston Martin? The hairs on the back of my neck still rise, even when I watch just a little clip of it. You have to tell me. I think the Mustang is the ultimate movie car. You know what? You can forget all that fancy computer-generated trickery of the last 10 years. This baby comes beamed direct from the 1960s. Its 10-minute car chase sequence through the streets of San Francisco has often been copied, but never bettered. And with Steve McQueen at the wheel, here surely is the ultimate combination of iconic driver with iconic car. Yes, your number one movie car of all time is the Ford Mustang from Bullet. Bullet is, without doubt, the best car chase ever. That car was a Mustang. Arr. They don't go around corners, they don't break, they don't accelerate that fast, to be honest. But in the context of that film, it just looked fabulous. Nine minutes of automotive pornography. And Steve McQueen drove the, drove the car that day. I think he is the actor who has most looked comfortable behind the wheel of a car. That whole chasing with that car, they only use two cars. Nowadays, when they do, you know, car chase scenes, they'll have like seven or eight or ten cars, you know. They definitely won't have two. But they only had two, which is a testament to how tough that car was. Oh, it's my dad's POV and you're going down the hill, right? And the Charger and then the Mustang and the Charger and the Mustang and then you hit that level plateau and then it drops off again. And I remember as a kid just going, wow.
That car was a complete extension of Steve McQueen. Watch that and you, part of you just thinks that's, that's fabulous and part of you just feels hopelessly and eternally inadequate. Because no matter what, you, you will never be Steve McQueen in that Mustang 390 GT, ever. It's a 1968 Mustang Fastback, Highland Green, black interior. It's got the 390 big block under the hood and a four-speed. Pretty much the same car Steve McQueen drove in Bullet. When I was a small child, my parents knew that I loved cars and took me to see this movie knowing there was a car chase in it. And ever since I first saw Steve McQueen in that Mustang, I always fantasized about having a car like that someday. No better car, I think, could be chosen than that Mustang. It just encapsulates everything that it was about. And it's just, you just look at it and you sigh in admiration. I bought the car in a classified ad from a local man who had the car in stock condition. And I knew that this would be a great tribute to Steve McQueen as a replica. So over the first few years I had the car, I did slow transitions, wheels, trim. Uh, it's an ongoing process and I'm still not finished. My role in the film Bullet was the director. Casting a car is rather like casting an actor. In fact, in a lot of ways, it's more important. So we wanted something that looked racy, but on the other hand, you believed that somebody of his salary could possibly own it. I named the car Steve as a tribute to Steve McQueen. I know usually you're supposed to name a boat or a car after a woman, but Steve fits this car. There's a lot of debate because Bullet is uh, reckoned to be the greatest car chase ever made. And there's the, did Steve McQueen do his own driving? Didn't he do his own driving? Well, did he do all his own driving? All of it. Steve drove it all. There was a time that um, I really discovered what a wonderful driver Steve McQueen is. We were going down this hill which went straight into the, uh, the end of our control road. I said, Steve, uh, I think that's okay. I think we've run out of film. He said, that's nothing. We've run out of brakes. <laughs> he stopped us, thank God, and we finished up in the ditch of the main road, both roaring with laughter. <laughs> Car chases work in the movies if you are there. You are there in that passenger seat with the wee-wee running down your legs, just loving every single minute. Steve McQueen wrote a letter dated 14 December 1977 to the people who had purchased the Mustang. Again, I would like to appeal to you to get back my 68 Mustang. I would be very happy to try to find you another Mustang similar to the one you have if there is not too much monies involved in it. Otherwise, we had better forget it. With kindest regards, I remain very truly yours, Steve McQueen. Well, we know where the original car is. It's in a barn in, in America, and we know the guy who owns it. If that went onto the market now, it's still got the camera mounts on it and everything. It could easily command $1 million, just like that. Where can I buy one? Coming up next... I'm going to show you what happened when the Roman Empire began to tear itself apart. The downfall of the original superpower in life and death in Rome. You are so beautiful to me. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Hundreds of movies to match your mood. One film to make your day. <laughs> Every day, this summer, on Sky Movies.
This woman is helping to overcome global poverty. She's not a high-profile economic advisor, nor is she a food scientist. She found the answer in her handbag and gives three pounds a month from her salary to Oxfam, knowing her employer, the Royal Bank of Scotland, will add twice as much again. Can you and your employer make it happen for Oxfam? Just stick it in and get on with it. <laughs> You can have it all night long if you want it. For free! <laughs> and when you're done, just give it back. And then move on to the next one. Buy three Pringles cans and rent a DVD for free from Blockbuster. How can you tell if he's the perfect catch? Hello, this is Ben. I'm our sex slave. I'll call your mother. <laughs> I really think you've got something here. Discover what he loves the most. I say sport, sex, and breathing. Get all the answers. It's an obsession. I know, it's just that I hate when it becomes... <gasps> Oopsie. And the perfect catch. This Hoover 1500 spin AAA rated washing machine is now £249, a price breakthrough. And this 42 inch Sony Grand Vega TV is now just £998, that's a total of £400 off. Curry's, always lowering prices. Does using dramatic hair colour mean you risk losing the shine? Not with new Fearless Colour from Herbal Essences. Unlike most hair colours, it has an ammonia-free liquid gel and up to six weeks supply of Evershine Conditioning Gloss, giving you stunning colour and up to 35% more shine, guaranteed to get you noticed. New Fearless Colour from Herbal Essences. Bring your colour out of the shade. Herbal Essences. with little beads of invigorating freshness. New bold two-in-one tablets. Saucy son, eh, very cool, and pomp sauteed. Splendid. One is utterly ravenous. Sausage rouge, old chap. It's this season's must-have, darling. It's so you. Ahem. You don't have to be posh to be privileged. All you need is four years, no claims on your car insurance, then privilege will guarantee to beat your renewal quote. Now give all the lardy our stuff a rest. Here, look. Get us a brew. Ten sugars are 12. For cheaper car insurance, call Privilege or buy at privilege.com. Tomorrow at 9, hypnotist Paul McKenna helps a chronic shopaholic and a nervous golfer when his brand new series continues. Now though, life and death in Rome.